timing of the work on the, on the EU global strategy in this consultation is absolutely vital. And, and, and in looking at, at these, this nexus of issues today, it seemed to me that it would be very important to highlight two kind of sets of approaches, looking at the root causes of problems and looking at the interconnections between issues and problems. But also bearing in mind that we're operating in an uncertain, unpredictable environment, and probably at all times in history you're operating in an uncertain, unpredictable environment, but like nobody predicted the Arab Spring, nobody predicted the conflict in Syria. Um, we thought as donors that the, 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 the development of the new first, newest independent state in Africa, South Sudan, had finally reached the point where it was working, one week before it fell apart. So unpredictability is also uh, an element that has to be taken account of in your strategic planning. More parochially, it occurred to me walking down O'Connell Street in the sunshine today that if somebody were walking down that very same street 100 years ago today, they would never have predicted that in eight weeks' time that street's physical architecture would be completely ruined, destroyed, and in ashes on the ground, or that the political and governance and, and, and societal architecture of the country would have, take, would have been quote unquote changed utterly. So we live in unpredictable times as ever. Um, now, I think it is also, the point has also been made very clearly that this new global strategy isn't simply a matter of, uh, replacing, of just replacing the European security strategy of 2003. We face crises to an unprecedented level across all aspects of the EU's external policy with severe strains internally. And the migration crisis that dominates the news is but a symptom of the building series of humanitarian crises over recent years. Not just in the Middle East and to the East, but also in, in, in across Af Africa. Uh, and I think we can say that developments and trends and relations with Africa will be vital for the European Union in the years ahead. And it seems to me that even for the purposes of just this exercise, we need to define Africa as our neighborhood, at least in order to understand the impact of developments and how we can respond in line with our interests and our values. And the danger at which the development of the global strategy can contribute towards averting is that we as a union will become defensive, short-termist, reactive, and frankly, afraid. And that a strategy could overfocus on the security of our existing borders, or even retreating borders in certain respects. So this must speak to a new relationship with Africa, a, a realistic relationship with Africa, and of course with the, with the AU. So within months of the adoption of the new framework for sustainable development in New York last September, with 17 uh, sustainable development goals to 2030, we've entered those of us working primarily on development, a period of intense debate, which you would think would have been solved by that process, on the nature of development, its relationship to politics and conflict, and the still existing divide between humanitarian work and spending, in the face of evidence which is all too clear now that the two overlap and are interdependent. In development, but also across the range of instruments and approaches we've defined for ourselves in the EU, we are hampered, I think, by our own definitions and divisions between politics, security, conflict, humanitarian development, economic and trade work, which do not actually reflect the reality on the ground for communities that are vulnerable, for migrants, for instance, or the challenges facing governments in Europe and in Africa. So the global strategy is an opportunity to take an integrated approach rather than a unidimensional approach. And unidimensional is the way that very often we have found ourselves over the years defining our relationship and understanding of Africa, a continent which is every bit as complex and differentiated as our own. Europe has thousands of years of experience of Africa. And indeed, it's often a major surprise to tourists who travel to Africa and, for instance, travel down the Nile to realize that the Greek civilization and architecture and temples that we are so proud of are actually derivative of the temples they see in Africa on the Nile. So 
we know a lot about Africa, or should know more than we sometimes take into account. <coughs> we know about the much more modern colonial area, era, but in recent times, we've rather simplistically looked at Africa in only one dimension. Maybe in the 60s, we saw it as a, as, as a beacon of independence movements and new governments. In the 70s, we started seeing it as increasingly dictatorial and corrupt. In the 80s and 90s, we began to see it as a continent of misery, poverty, hunger, and hopelessness. We responded under the MDGs with massive aid for basic services, often defined by our inputs rather than the results and outcomes. And then more recently, in recent years, we reached a point where we started to define Africa by its high growth rates. With the suggestion by some that trade and economic growth would lift all boats and uh, with the emergence of a new middle class would pull development and obviate the need for any more aid. So we've been a bit simplistic at times in the way we look at Africa and sometimes in contradictory ways in very short time spans. Some believe that the era for ODA was over last year. Uh, and that became clear within the EU, even as we were discussing the, um, the approach for the SDGs. Now, to many, if you're being simplistic and not looking at what we've achieved and what has been achieved in Africa, Africa is sometimes seen as a threat to our borders in the medium and long term. A continent of, uh, suffering the effects of climate change, humanitarian crisis, conflict and inequality, but the reality is far more complicated. Yes, there, is the effect, there are the effects of climate change, of conflict, but there has been huge progress, and the human development indicators show that in terms of education, uh, extreme poverty, even hunger, and including the fight against AIDS. In recent years, as, we, as, we, as has been said, average GDP growth rates in Africa were exceeding 5, 6, 7, 8 percent, uh, partly driven, but not solely, by commodity prices. Now, this year, they should be around an average of 3.5 percent. EU trade with Africa is up 50% in the past uh, 10 years. We in Ireland have seen the need for an integrated Africa strategy, as, as Aidan said. And the IMF have pointed out that to meet the needs of the population entering the workforce, Africa needs to create 18 million jobs annually, as Aidan stated, as opposed to the 2 million achieved over the past uh, decade. So with high growth rate, population growth rate, we can see both the achievements, but also the huge challenges. By 2050, 25% of the world's population will be in Africa. It will be more urbanized, it will be younger. And it will be, if we want to look at it that way, a source of potential future migration into Europe. And that is before we take account of the effects of conflict. Conflicts have expanded in Africa in recent years for a number of reasons, <coughs> ever, all for reasons that include climate change, governance, human rights, and even the basis on which states have been established, have been established. And the EU it could be accused, perhaps, of not adopting an effective integrated approach. Political, economic, development, and humanitarian policies are all too often separate and segmented and decided in different forums and rooms. The Sustainable Development Goals should provide the framework, if not the full range of implementing instruments, to look at our relationship with Africa. Agenda 2030 not only vows to leave no one or group behind, it provides a comprehensive integrated framework for sustainable development. It says there will be no development without peace and security and vice versa. Goal 5 is on gender equality and women's empowerment. Goal 16, peaceful and inclusive state societies, access to justice for all. So as a framing <coughs> guideline, we recognize that the threats in Africa from conflict and extremism to poverty and inequality can be defined through a sustainable development approach which addresses the causes and effects of conflict and bridges the humanitarian development divide. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to development under the MDGs, ODA rose at its height two years ago, and probably last year, to about $135 billion. Under the SDGs, in order to reach those targets we have agreed for 2030, the least developed countries will require development finance of some 3.5 to 4.5 trillion per year. Now that's not obviously, and nobody suggests it should, come from aid. Domestic resource mobilization is essential, the private sector will be essential, but domestic resource mobilization of that order is impossible without taxation. And taxation to that extent requires citizens' consent and therefore good governance. 
And that shows that there's no such thing as a segmented development alone approach, <coughs> that the, the, the development does depend on good governance, peace and security. They are all linked. And the era of OTA, I think everybody now sees, is not over. There are countries that still uh, depend on OTA, especially the least developed countries and fragile states. The EU is by far the largest donor to Africa. The EDF alone, over the next six years, will provide 38.5 billion. And Ireland, for instance, our aid, about 80 to 85 percent of it goes to sub-Saharan Africa. So although migration is now recognized as a problem, it itself is not necessarily the lens through which we should uh, view our relations in, with Africa, even if it sometimes is, in these days, the, 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 the biggest issue in the, in, in the media. But it's a reality which needs a comprehensive approach by the EU if we are not to increasingly react uh, in the short term, year after year. So as I said, I don't think we need to redefine our development, security, or political approach through a migration lens, but we do need to understand why people become refugees or migrants, and probably in Ireland we're quite well placed psychologically uh, to do this. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily help to make strong distinctions between refugees and migrants in trying to understand this. For whatever the immediate impulse, it's clear that all leave in search of a secure livelihood. They leave their homes because they feel they have no other option. The root causes are poverty and underdevelopment, lack of economic opportunity, politics and insecurity, climate change and degradation of farmland, and, 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 and increasing urban uh, slums and, and poverty. They come to Europe only when there is the right mix of, to put it crudely, the right mix is the way to put it, when there is the, the, uh, an essential mix of hopelessness confirmed by time and the protracted nature of conflicts, and perceived opportunity. So it is increasingly being realized that conflict is driving most of the humanitarian crisis, which are driving what we now call irregular migration, a term I keep reading now, I wasn't fully familiar with it before. We have to look at root causes. And this is recognized in theory at least, but the pressure of events often dictates short-term emergency responses, drawn from the same financial resources available for long-term work in Africa. And the complexity is such that if we focus exclusively on the misery of those presenting themselves in boats or on our borders, we are actually focusing on those who have the initiative and the funds to get here, because they can pay the smugglers. And we are leaving the truly hopeless behind in extreme poverty. So it is absolutely critical, and this is a debate that is happening very actively now in the development sphere, to redefine our humanitarian and development approaches. Uh, and we have to do so <coughs> by redirecting funding to bolster long-term gains because of humanitarian crises in Africa. I was going to, and I'll do it later, tell you the extent of those crises is actually increasing because of El, El Nino as well as conflict. And that's at the same time as recognizing the progress uh, that has been made. So we have a big, big challenge in the area of development in looking, there will not be additional funding, we know that. So we need to look more strategically at it. And I think the challenge then, and we need to look at the, at the, at the, at the commitments we've, gave, we've given to providing between 0.15 to 0.2% of our GDP in aid to the least developed countries, even while we provide humanitarian aid for crises such as in, 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 in Syria. So finally, I would say that no global strategy with Africa will work if it fails to include or deal separately with the different dimensions of that relationship. Agenda 2030 will be tested for the first time at the World Humanitarian Summit in May and at the Migration Summit, which the UN Secretary General has called for the 19th of, of September. And the issues that we will address at those are exactly the issues which need to be addressed in our EU global strategy, whether they be exclusively for Africa or not. And so I would just say we need to ensure the coherence of our political, climate, economic, development, humanitarian, and security interventions and approaches. We need to look at the role of the vulnerable and least powerful, and we need to look at the work we can do in areas such as agriculture. These are as valid and important uh, as, as the security response, and they are not, and a lot of them respond to our values and are reflections of our values, but if you look at it, they are also our interests. Because at its crudest, 
if migration is, what, and, and regular migration is what people are afraid of, well, the, the, the pressures in Africa are going to ensure that if we don't work coherently and strategically with Africa, that's what you'll get, is more uh, irregular migration. And it can only be dealt with through a truly partnership approach. And I would say, within the European Union, a more coherent approach across our instruments. And I would also say, just to add the other final statement, to add the other side of the, of the, of the, of the phenomenon that Aidan mentioned about Africa talking to us about colonialism, we need, to, we need sometimes to, 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 to examine how we look to Africa. And so as an EU, perhaps we need to make even more progress than we have made already in ensuring that our approaches to different issues and regions in Africa are not predominantly seen through the prism of the former colonial power in that, in that region. So we have, a, we have work to do in partnership to understand each other. I cannot emphasize how much I agree with uh, the remarks that were just uh, in, in your final points uh, and how happy I am to be in Ireland. Our country is dear to my heart for personal family reasons as well, but also that I have been discovering myself. Uh, uh, the ambassador mentioned uh, Roger Casement and uh, um, Latin American writer Mario Vargas Llosa has written a, a novel uh, that is very successful and that I have read and that has very clearly established this connection between Europe, Africa and uh, the world that uh, can be seen in very fresh eyes. And uh, it has been said, and I think uh, we don't emphasize it enough, Europe is very diverse. And uh, even myself, when I work on Africa, just the fact that I am not French, but I am, you know, that uh, it, it helps. And I think as Irish, you have a lot of advantages because of your sensitivity towards famine, towards uh, underdevelopment, towards the issues that have been mentioned. And also I would underline this uh, um, aspect of religion, because in European policy making in general, and I would say in Western policy making, mostly in the United States, we have a blind spot for religion. Because of uh, our secular bias in government, because of our own history of states, we do not include proper analysis of religion when we do our policies. Now, you all know why this is the case in our uh, policy-making structures, in our governments, in the way we even study and analyze uh, the world and conflict. But this has led to a blind spot. And if we want to understand extremism, as you mentioned, radicalization, but also the positive and just the inherent role that religion plays in countries of Africa, uh, we will be just uh, getting better analysis and better policies. And I think the Irish approach can help us with that as well. Um, so get to see Africa through Irish eyes and get Africans uh, to also see Europe uh, through the Irish mediator, I would say, and not just the colonial power. It's uh, really in the interest of us all. Migration and security, just a few points maybe and then open up for discussion and uh, invite those of you who want to know more details on some of the aspects. Um, on migration I would say, let's consider already for starters that as many people come from the south to the north every year as from the south to the south. So uh, mobility in the world happens as much from south to north as it happens within the south, and this includes also African mobility. Now I think our global strategy, and in general our strategy, our, our future world, should be um, targeting at a world that has that third pillar of as many people moving also from the north to the south. So the mobility, opening up our minds, and not just thinking about the walls <coughs> between the south going to the north, or the walls that also exist of the South having mobility within the, the South itself. But that we can also think that a more prosperous Africa, a more developed Africa, is also in the interest for Europeans and for our generations that are global, and that will be only more global, I think, in the, in, in the decades uh, to come. In the, long inter in the long term, I think this is clearly in everybody's interest, but in the short term, there is obviously an African interest to make migration safe, to make migration legal, but let's not kid ourselves as Europeans, there is not an African interest to curb migration. Migration is useful and positive for Africa, as it is for us as well, but the remittances in the hard currency, the role that uh, uh, 
the migration has for these societies leads us to have a dialogue where we should really emphasize that the perceptions also in the short term has to be a fair debate about the mid-term and the long-term interest. Now, this is going to be hard, but I think both in the European Union and in the African Union we should be used to having hard debates as well. I would say that in the case of the AU, as in the European Union case, um, the capacity on an issue such as migration is limited. We are seeing, we see the shortcomings of the EU, even if we have agreements of principle to implement them. I would expect that the African Union cannot do much better than the EU, uh, in the sense that member states are still very much in control as our own European member states. So in our partnership with the African Union, we also have to be smart about the dialogues and be open uh, about engaging with those who need to be engaged with. Uh, I would think that uh, this is the case also for Europe and the European Union, seen from the, from the African perspective. Of course, there can be the bilateral agreements, there can be also the long-term perspectives of investment, and uh, I would understand that in the especially south-to-south -south, uh, movements, intra-African movements, it is also in the European interest to work on this, to let uh, Cote d'Ivoire become a new powerhouse, the powerhouse that it used to be in West Africa. It was in Abidjan that recently opened uh, the newest, largest shopping mall uh, of Africa. Uh, and I, uh, I haven't been there myself yet, but I have heard that there you can buy Ivorian chocolate. Now you would think that's, oh, how can that be news? Actually it is news, because as you know as well, coffee and cacao is exported so that the chocolates are made outside of Africa, but now you can buy Ivorian made chocolate in the shopping mall in Abidjan. So we also, with these examples, need to change our, our image of, of Africa, and that this is in our interest that the industrialization, the growth of our services in these economies is uh, what the world really needs, uh, African, Europeans, and, and all. I still think, and I am not an economist, but I still think that the idea of the traps that were analyzed by Professor Paul Collier long ago in the bottom billion and uh, the resource course economics, uh, and uh, it was mentioned, Carlos Lopez as well, analysis of watch out the economy, the macroeconomy of Africa is in a very fragile position, also need to be kept in mind. Moving on to security, I'll make um, three points. Uh, terrorism, which is of course in our uh, very, very, uh, very much in our interest. I would say that a, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, African leaders thought terrorism was a Western problem. 2001, so what, now it's obviously no longer the case. This is a problem in Africa where African leaders have also realized there is a challenge. But I still think this is a bit of a wild card. We don't know how terrorism is going to play out differently uh, in Somalia, from Mali, from how it can expand into Tanzania, uh, other East Africa places, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, which have been spared for the time being, that we know can be very easily targeted. So it is still an area where fragility is only on the rise, and uh, the complicated picture that you were depicting, I think, is only going to get more complex. This is because the radicalization and transformation of Islam is also something that these societies maybe don't um, seize and are you know, themselves uh, living as they go. We are observers here, we need to learn from what is being told to us and from what the analysts locally tell us. I think uh, the, the best expertise I get on, uh, on radicalization in West Africa is from colleagues in, uh, in Senegal, in San Louis, also Algerians, also uh, in Mali. You, we have to see how they see their societies and they can uh, teach us about the potential evolutions. Same goes for West Africa, differently from East Africa. The problem of Kenya is not the same as Ethiopia. Uh, Kenyan friends uh, get a lot of pressure because they say, oh, how come Ethiopia hasn't got attacked while well, we are constantly attacked and the, the Shabab really uh, 
fester in the coast of Kenya. And of course, there are reasons that explain this in the nature of uh, the religion, of the social and ethnic composition of uh, uh, Kenya <coughs> as a state, but also in the governance and the structure that make it as, a, as an authoritarian state, in the case of Ethiopia, a stronger, even more resilient state towards terrorism. Which brings a complication. It means that when you have a strong, resilient states, they might be authoritarian states. I come from Spain, a country where we know authoritarianism. We also know extremist uh, religion. Uh, so uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, it is uh, complex, but not unheard of and not something that should be impossible to, to think of. This is tied in the European Union, African Union uh, case to the capacity building agenda. I think this cannot be disconnected from politics and from the fact that the security forces in the African countries are also very often regime forces. And uh, that maybe in the case, of course, the case of South, of South Africa is a wonderful exception uh, that we can see uh, as almost a an idea to, to have this cooperation for capacity building in the rest of Africa. Better than having uh, Spaniards or Irish that have gone in serious definition would be to have South Africans or other Africans. But the fact that not all security forces, and uh, with this we go not only into militaries but also the security forces of police and so on, are not democratic or from democratic states, poses problems that poses problems for our cooperation with the African Union. Why? Because, because of issues related to international law. International law and humanitarian law as well, laws in, so laws in the war. Uh, think, for example, of the Chadian army fighting Boko Haram and terrorism. The Chadian army is a very, uh, very effective army in the fight against terrorism. It has been very effective in the Lake Chad region. One of the main partners was the French and the others who are active fighting terrorism in the Sahel. But thank you. The, but the, the Chadian army uh, makes no prisoners. Nobody survives. So this is completely rolling over. So don't go ask for human rights, humanitarian law. Where are the prisoners? Where are we going to judge? No. So that poses a problem. It poses a problem also. Uh, Right now, the possibility of financing um, UN operations uh, or African Union or UN, because the UN traditionally does peacekeeping, and what we are asking African Union to do is to enforce uh, peace, to enforce and to do peace building, not just peacekeeping. So we have that issue also of the tradition of the UN intervention and security, international security to sort out. I would say that, it's a, as it was uh, also underlined in the first uh, panel, that uh, the main conflicts in Africa are still the kind of inequality, uh, grievance-ridden uh, uh, conflicts. So it is not with uh, the fight against terrorism that we will get rid of, uh, of violence and conflict in, uh, in Africa. And I would say, as a final point, uh, the example of Libya, which is a bit in between those two, the, the internal conflict, the terrorism or, uh, uh, or risk of terrorism, uh, but also the geopolitics. When uh, the Libyan um, crisis, if you want to write, from the Gaddafi fall uh, took place, Africans came to see us and said, we told you, the African Union, the, the African states were against this intervention. Europe, some European countries led intervention in Libya. We didn't listen, we have a mess. Maybe we should listen, because the fragility of Chad, of Sudan, of Niger, of Central African Republic, these countries, they know their neighbors, they know each other without. So I am coming here with the same criticism that I uh, just mentioned about Chad. A legitimate uh, engagement on uh, a say in peace and intervention for security in their regions. Thank you.